So I'm really happy today to introduce Christina Mitchell, who is our master beekeeping and training. And she's had 12 years of experience uh, with beekeeping and honey production. She's engaged in the master beekeeping program at the Dice Lab at Cornell. And she is going to explore the equipment, methods, costs, and, and, and particulars about bees themselves. And um, maybe after this presentation, you will decide to dive into beekeeping. So at this point, I'm going to share her slides and let her take over. Thank you, thank you, Marianne. So what we're going to do here, this is a very basic introduction to beekeeping. And I'm really thrilled that there are so many people in the community that are interested in keeping bees. So let's get moving here on this own. So honeybees have actually been around for a few million years. And at least for 10,000 years, uh, records have survived of man's exploitation of honey. Okay. so. As I say, uh, bees have been around a long, long time. You can see there's a first slide here um, and there's fantastic YouTube videos of indigenous people in rainforest areas who are just cutting sheets of honeycomb off of trees um, in caves. You know, they've got those deep volcanic looking, volcanic looking caves and they've been enjoying the honey. Um, somebody decided at one point that we should keep some bees closer to home. So, the earliest type of beekeeping equipment might have been a big hollow log where bees are going to set up housekeeping anyway. Um, this on the right, you might notice, uh, it looks like something out of an English garden because it is, it's called a bee skep, um, a skep or a cloach. And what happens is that just kind of goes over a bunch of bees and they will go ahead and build their frames right in that structure. The problem with something like that is extracting the honey meant that a lot of bees were going to die because the people were not so concerned about keeping the bees as they were getting the honey. Now, the importance here of pollinators, we all have heard about California almonds. We know that without pollinators, and that includes bees, butterflies, hummingbirds, bats to a lesser extent, um, there would be no California almonds. In this area, when we hear about the almonds, we say, okay, we like almonds, but what's the big deal? Anytime we lose a crop of any kind or there's any stress, it's going to affect us globally. So bringing it back to home in this area, according to the US Department of Agriculture, pollinators provide approximately $344 million worth of pollination services to New York and add $29 billion in value to crop production nationally each year. This is important because New York's ability to produce the crops such as apples, grapes, cherries, onions, pumpkins, and cauliflower rely heavily on the presence of these pollinators. If you decide to go into beekeeping for whatever reason, there are so many New York State programs, there's lots and lots of help out there. The New York State Pollinator Protection Plan, this is a bunch of people, they all work together, they made the pollinator task force, um, farmers, apiarists, pesticide applicators and environmentalists were involved. What they did is they developed best practices so that we could all do pretty much the right thing with keeping bees. Um, they uh, try to protect the environment um, and they will look at native population. They manage and manage pod pollinators. Um, the research is ongoing everywhere. Let me just jump to the next slide here for a second. Uh, Cornell University's Dice Lab for Honeybee Studies in New York is the state's hub for honeybee and pollinator research and outreach. If you have any questions at all about bees, um, if you have hives already and you're not sure what's going on, these are the people to reach out to. You're never going to be alone in beekeeping around here. Um, and why keep bees? Do you want to make some honey for personal consumption? Um, do you want to just uh, pollinate your own garden. Maybe you have a small orchard and you want to ensure that you have enough pollinators. Or do you want to offer pollination services, which includes bringing your hives uh, to other orchards or other farms to pollinate? Some people want them just to protect the pollinators. And you could have it as a side business. Some people like it as a retirement business, little side money in doing something that they enjoy. 
Okay, so types of hives, if you're gonna get into this, the ones you see most often, they're Langstroth hives. That's the top photo there. It's not painted. Usually around here, you see them painted all bright colors. Um, interestingly, bees see red as black. So that's just the one color I would stay away from. Um, when you're painting a hive, go ahead over to Home Depot or the paint shop in Delhi and grab the Oops paint. As long as it's an outdoor paint, it's perfect for painting the hive and sealing it. Um, a top bar hive. They're not as common, but there are people around here who use them. That's that longer structure on the bottom. And what happens there is the frames go sideways instead of being built up. Um, the Ware hive, that white hive, is very, very similar to Langstroth. Um, again, as far as getting supplies, you're better off in this area with Langstroth because um, those supplies are readily available. So the basics of honeybees. You saw in the first photo where there was just a big, big old comb of honey hanging down and people used to just cut that off. Bees will always build their comb in a pattern. If you see the photo on the right, that's a hollow of a tree or something going on there. And maybe this side was taken out for the photo. Bees like to have everything lined up. They have enough space for themselves. They have enough space to put their brood. That's the babies, the egg, larva, etc and they have enough place for honey storage. On the left, as you can see, um, that is a removable frame from a Langstroth hive. And that's absolutely copying what they do in nature, just side by side. Um, we'll go into what each hive has here. But first, I just wanted to say something about the races of bees, because there are several. This is going to be important because when you pick out what traits you want in the bees, you can look at this list and basically see what each one brings to the table. If you want nice gentle bees, um, maybe the Caucasians, um, but if you look further, there are some downsides to each. There are new hybrids, uh, buckfast bees, that's way over to the right there. There are very gentle bees, very prolific bees, and they have some mite resistance, which is also extremely important in this area. Okay, so the queen bee in the hive, she is the queen bee, she does it all. She, uh, she calls the shots. She lays thousands of eggs during her lifetime. Um, she may lay over 2000 eggs in a single day, provided the colony is strong enough that they can keep building out wax um, comb and have plenty of place for her to lay her eggs. She can live up to five years. Generally, that doesn't happen because when she starts to lay less, the bees will replace her or in a commercial apiary, the, um, the beekeeper will actually replace her. She is similar to the other bees in the shape of her thorax, but then her, the, her um, body itself is a long, almost cigar shape. Um, if you notice in, I think this picture is good enough that you can see it, she has, um, her wings don't cover her whole body. They kind of stop and leave about a third of it um, open there. Uh, the queen does have a stinger. She only uses it to sting other queens that might be her rivals if they hatched out in the hive and she's not quite ready to give up her uh, throne yet. Um, and generally, there's only one queen in a hive. We won't get into where that would change until we do a more detailed class. So the queen bee, she develops from fertilized egg. She must mate with a drone to produce the fertilized eggs. So therefore, she's the mother of all the bees in the hive and her role is to produce the eggs and release pheromones. That's where the bees get their clues as to what they're going to do in the hive. Worker bees are sexually underdeveloped females um, and they might be 60,000 strong in a hive. And uh, basically the population is going to depend on a lot of factors like the room inside the hive. If bees have plenty of room to increase their numbers, they have plenty of incoming food supply and they have a decently laying queen, they can build up rapidly. They're called workers for obvious reasons. All they do is work all day. <laughs> this is a bee thing. Um, they will build the comb. They will uh, do the housework. They'll maintain the interior temperatures and they can guard the hive. Um, they're kind of like the goalie. There's a few of them that are sitting right there at the bottom board. And if anything tries to come in that they don't like, they will attack and they will give their lives for that because they can only sting once. 
Oh, female worker bees under certain conditions can lay eggs, but because they're not mated, all of those resulting um, bees will be drones. So the worker bee is developed from that fertilized egg. The worker bee lives for a short period of time. Here it says usually about 40 days. That's during the summer months. These bees are worked so hard that they really just don't last that long. But the bees produced in late summer, early fall are going to be the winter bees. So they'll obviously survive through the winter. It says um, that a worker bee spends its first 20 days in the hive performing various tasks. That number can change depending on what the hive needs. If suddenly they need more foragers, these new bees kind of get the, uh, kind of get the boot and get out there and start collecting. So their first task when they come out of the cell is to turn around and clean their own cell. This way, when the queen comes along, she can lay a new egg in there. So the, I put these slides on here because the worker bee has pollen baskets on her rear legs. So if you can see in that right photo, that big yellow glob there is not part of the bee's anatomy. That's actually pollen that she's pushed into the baskets that she's gonna carry back to the hive. Uh, drones are the males. Uh, the general shape is more round, a um, little plug there. To me, they look like overgrown house flies. Uh, they do not have a stinger. The drone develops from an unfertilized egg meaning that he's only passing on that genetic material from his mother because there was um, no drone to, to uh, add to that gene pool. So it's half the genetic material in worker bees. And a lot of people consider them worthless. There's gotta be a reason why there's three to 500 of them in a hive because it only takes one to fertilize the queen. The queen is not fertilized within the hive. She goes on a mating flight and only one lucky drone gets to do the job and he will die after doing that. Um, drones can be created, as I said, by layer worker bees, but that's more advanced. We don't need to do that right now. Okay, so the development time for these eggs into bees, slightly different. All of them are an egg until day three. From there, the queen will emerge first on day 16. Workers need 21 days. The drone, a little lazy, he comes out on the 24th day. That's going to be important to know when we get to mites because Varroa mites like to lay their eggs in the big cells that are gonna have a bee in there to feed off of for a long time. So when the mite hatches out, it's gonna feed off the fat bodies in the bee. So uh, yeah, the queen is actually, she's fertile on the 23rd day, whereas the drone is not fertile till his 38th day. But they all start the same. It's an egg that stands straight up in the cell they become larva, the other bees will cap that cell and in the pupil stage, it's capped until they emerge. The bee cast system, this is just showing you drone cells that you can see on the left of the slide. They tend to have a puffed top on them. There are larger cells. So um, remember that because when I talk about drone comb, the foundation has a larger hexagon for them to start, the bees to start drawing out the comb on. Um, the workers, that's kind of right there in the center, they're more flat. They've got some texture on the top. But um, as soon as they come out of their cells, I thought this slide might have shown an emerging bee, but on this view, I can't see it. Um, the queen cell basically looks like a peanut. Um, in a frame of brood, what you'll see when the queen is laying well is the entire center will be worker cells towards the outside edges will be the drone cells. We don't know if that's because they feel the drones are more expendable. So if there's a cold snap or something that the drones would be affected first. Queen cells like these are usually to overtake a queen. Otherwise you'll kind of see them more often on the bottom of the cell. Um, okay, bee swarming. Everybody's heard about bee swarming and everybody seems to think until they learn more that it's a, it's a bad thing. But actually it's a very, very good thing because um, what the bees are doing, they're kind of saying they've outgrown their hive. There's not enough room to build up more bees and more honey stores. It might be too hot for them, it might be too humid. Ventilation is very important in a hive. In the summertime, I suggest to people that the top of the hive, the top box has an, an extra entrance in it. And I like to prop up the top of the hive so that they get some air that way. 
So high humidity and poor ventilation, as you can imagine, makes it unbearable. So what happens is the queen decides she's going to take about half her workers. There have been scouts out looking for sites um, for a, a new nesting area, a new hive. And one day they just decide they're going to gorge on um, honey, so they're nice and full, and they take off looking for a new place to live. The scouts, when they come back, they will be doing elaborate dances and you know, all kinds of nonverbal cues uh, to tell them, I found a great spot. And basically the bee that comes back and says, uh, basically sells the product the most is the one who usually wins out. Sometimes the bees will take off. It's really cool to kind of watch because it's like a cyclone and off they go. Sometimes they don't get as far as the new site and they'll land in a tree. That's why people will um, very frequently uh, see a clump of bees hanging from a tree. Um, and when they're in that state, they're actually quite gentle. They're loaded up um, in, with honey. They have real, no real reason to sting. The only, they are protecting their queen, but they're not protecting brood. They're not protecting the hive. So if you do manage to catch a swarm of bees, you, you don't have to worry too much about, you know, bee swarm attacking you or anything like that. It's not like the movies. There's a, this old adage, I think it's actually, might have originally been from the farm, farmer's almanac, that a swarm of bees in May is worth a load of hay. A swarm of bees in June is worth a silver spoon. And a swarm of bees in July isn't worth a fly. The reason they say that is if you catch an early swarm and you hive them up, you've got plenty of time for those bees to go ahead and start building out comb, reproducing, make lots of little baby bees and put up enough honey. Um, June is still good. If you get a swarm in July, especially late July, you have to remember that those bees still have to build out all the wax. They have to go out and get supplies. Um, the queen has to start laying. So if those young aren't hatched until August, then uh, are they going to have the resources to get through the winter? I will still go out and get a swarm of bees in July because you can combine hives. That's another kind of specialty thing we won't get into now. You don't just throw all the bees together, but there's still some value to these late swarms. Plus, I'd like to try to save the bees. Um, let's see. So obtaining your bees, there are four general ways. Some people start with swarms. If they have their bee equipment set up, they will put out swarm traps. Um, there's package bees you can buy. A nuke hive is a nucleus colony. It's, it's a, essentially a miniature hive. Or you can start with an established hive. So the advantage of a swarm, it's not quite free. Um, if you put out swarm boxes, you know, you've got some equipment in there and you've got to buy a swarm lure of some kind. Old beeswax will sometimes be a good enough lure for them. There are pheromones that you can buy. You put a few drops in there. Um, usually you put it up high. The bees will take a look at it and decide whether they think it's a good place to be. Lemongrass essential oil mimics the pheromone of a content bee or a content hive. So sometimes a drop of essential oil will be enough to draw the bees. You cannot make the entrance too big or the, pet, the next passing bird who needs a nesting site might take over instead. So the disadvantage, obviously, you can't depend on a swarm. Um, you don't have control over the generic, uh, genetics, excuse me. Um, and the bees may be carrying disease because that's another reason they may swarm. Um, it's not just crowding in the hive that will do that. Sometimes uh, it's just not comfortable for them. Sometimes they're leaving behind um, maybe a high uh, mite load and they just go ahead and swarm to look for a new place to live. So there are some disadvantages. Feral bees, I, I put in this slide just to show you, there are bee trees. There's less and less feral bees all the time, of course, um, but there are bee trees just in this area. Uh, you can't obviously just go out to somebody's property and start taking down their trees. But if you ask permission, they may let you set up swarm hives so that when the bees swarm, which is natural, they're going to do it, they may move into your swarm hive. Bees will sometimes swarm and go into a house. They love soffits. 
They love any little space between the levels of the house. And people will call me and say, I have a swarm. I ask how long it's been there. If it's been there more than a few months, that's not a swarm anymore. That gentleness that I was talking about, that's kind of gone. Now they think that house is their house. So they will kind of fight to protect it. So you have to kind of be careful um, you know, when you answer calls for swarms, if you intend to do that, ask people to send you a photo also, because sometimes you'll be asked to remove yellow jacks, paper wasps. That's not really what a honey beekeeper would do. Okay, when you start with a package of bees, a package is basically bees that a frame was taken from a hive and bees were shaken out um, into a box. And what they do too, they will raise queens uh, queen rearing is another specialty, <clears throat> and what they'll what they'll do these bees might go out for the queens will go out for a mating flight. When she's back, they package her up separately with a couple of attendant bees, and they include her in this package. It's basically a couple of wood sides screen around the rest of it. There's a little cap on top that you can screw on uh, some sugar water, syrup water, and uh, the bees can drink that as they go. Um, it shouldn't have a lot of drones in it because this is from uh, the brood. So you really should get enough worker bees to start off the hive. Um, and depending, you know, this is going to depend a lot how many bees you get, what size package. Uh, to give you an idea, there's about 4,000 bees per pound. So if you're ordering a two pound package of bees, you expect about 8,000 bees. Um, in New York, the package bees need a certificate of inspection because people who raise them need to have that. Disadvantage, they're going to take a lot longer to develop into a production hive because you're putting them into a hive with these frames and foundation that, um, if you use foundation, that they still have to draw out and create all this wax. So um, that's gonna take them a few weeks. The other thing is the queen that you got might be poorly mated um, sometimes the bees just don't like her and they want to get rid of her. So I would suggest on this that you go ahead and after a week you check to make sure they're doing what they're supposed to do, draw out this comb, that the queen is laying the eggs, um, and no eggs means something is wrong. If you notice that something is wrong, it's usually with the queen at that point as long as there's space for her. So you might want to contact um, one of the places that will sell you a new queen. Okay, uh, let's see. Oh, there's, but the one thing about it, there is less contamination because there's no wax coming from another bee yard and wax can sometimes harbor disease. Now, a nucleus colony or a nuke, it's gonna cost you more than a package because what it is, is a miniature beehive. It's got frames in there that already have bee larva, drawn out comb, bee larva, bee eggs, uh, various stages of development. Um, in this photo, you're supposed to be able to see the queen, and there she is. She's kind of above the line there. The longer body shows. Um, the nice thing about this, even though you are getting drawn comb uh, from this option, what you're also getting is, again, the possibility that some of this comb might be infected with some kind of viruses, some kind of bacterial thing. So there are some things. It will if you do it right and you put it into a hive and if there are no diseases that came with this with this wax then you should get some honey the first year not a lot but some and from that nuke colony you could also make a second hive you make what's called a split again that's more advanced so that would be saved for anybody who wants to come and do a longer bee class uh, disadvantage the drawn comb uh, the comb may contain american fowl brood spores it's a serious disease I'll touch upon that later. Some sellers try to get rid of their very old foundation and comb. It's very dark. If you do wind up with a nuke like that, um, I would suggest you never go back to that seller again and find somebody else. Ask in your local bee club where they get nukes from. Um, starting with an established hive. This sounds great. You're gonna get somebody's hives. You're gonna put them on your property. It's gonna cost you a lot of money if you can get it at all people don't generally want to get rid of their established hives. You do have situations where uh, maybe there was a death in the family, the beekeeper in the family died, and maybe the, the, the widow or what have you wants to just sell all the uh, hives and the equipment. Um, I would be very cautious. 
just because all of this old foundation probably has a lot of residue of pesticides used over the years. Um, what I do in my apiary, and I suggest to people, when you put in new foundation, get your Sharpie, put the date that that foundation went in. And every so often, trade out all your old comb and start fresh. It just It's worth it to have the bees have to build up some more comb, more hygienic. So the advantage is obviously you've got a ready-made hive and it's gonna produce honey that first year. It can be split into two hives or more if it's strong enough. Um, it's gonna be the highest cost. It may swarm early in the season because it gets crowded quicker. So you have to be very careful with management that you're gonna go ahead and split that hive if it needs it. Um, you are going to um, check when you do your, your management chores to see if there are signs of disease. This last I don't worry about so much. Old queen might need to be replaced. The bees will generally do that themselves. If they don't for some reason, it's uh, fine to order a new queen. And requeening is a little bit detailed. So again, that's for a more detailed class. So managing bees, before you get any bees at all, what's really, really important is to plan ahead. Your honeybees should not be a nuisance to your neighbors. So I wouldn't put it on the fence line, you know, facing their pool or their, their backyard. Um, a hive of bees really should be facing south, ideally. Doesn't need full sun, but if it's got a little bit of a natural wind block, that's even better. Uh, located within a short flying distance to a water source. We are blessed here in Delaware County because water doesn't seem to usually be a problem. Um, protected from heat during summer months. Uh, I, three years in a row, I planted, uh, I planted a tree about 20 feet in front of to the left of my hives. And for some reason, they don't want to grow there. So, oh, easy access to hives. This is so important because people say, oh, this is a great place for the bees. They won't be disturbed by anything. Make sure that you can get in that spot with all your beekeeping equipment, wheelbarrow if necessary. Honey supers are extremely heavy. So when you're taking stuff off the hive and you've got bees who don't want you taking it off the hive and you're struggling already, make life easier for yourself. Have flat areas to work. Um, I do tend to have a folding table out there because on the monthly inspections too, we're also doing mite checks. So you need some extra things to do the mite check with. So easy access to hive, very important. Uh, just to keep it interesting, I threw some of the common water sources you can set up if you uh, plan to have bees and you know your neighbor has a very enticing pool. Bees are creatures of habit. So once they start finding a place for water, they're always going to look there for their water. Uh, the top there, that's just a poultry waterer and it's got some stones in it so that they can't drown in that water. Change them often. You don't really want to put that right out in full sun because it's going to get funky really fast. Um, I have three or four of them in operation myself, so I just switch them out and it's just much easier. Um, bird bath down in the left lower corner there, when the bees are thirsty, that is gonna need filling often. That's the type that has a little base in the middle, but so I don't fill it too deep unless I put stones around the outside edge. Uh, you can see uh, in this, but this is not my photo in the center and I cannot find credit to give to the person who took it. Um, all pollinators uh, get along pretty well for the most part, and it looks like they'll share their resources. Over to the right there, that's just a water pan with some marbles in it. And once they get used to their water source, as I said, they'll come back. Just make sure you keep filling it for them. Uh, so keeping bees in communities, you have to make sure there's no ordinances or restrictions that say you can't use your property for bees. Um, make sure you have that water source nearby. Again, the swimming pool issue. Uh, if you have Stock tanks, if you float pieces of wood in them, a lot of times they'll use the stock tank. Um, and you know you wanna to try to keep them near their home that you don't wanna have them going too far for water. Make sure you have enough property and space to do this. If you rent, obviously get permission first. You don't need your landlord kicking you out over bees. Bees are considered livestock. So you have the right to protect your bees, especially if they're producing for you. Um, you don't want to keep more than three or four beehives on the half acre lot. It's just not a good idea. It's too much of a concentration. That said, you do see people that have beehives practically on top of each other. 
The problem with that is in the very busy season, the guards at the door aren't going to keep out a bee that has pollen baskets full. So if this bee comes in and it really belongs to the hive next door, it's called drift because they will drift to the next hive. If one hive has a, an issue, some kind of virus or something, it's very easy to spread it that way. So I like to try to spread them out a little bit more than is commonly used in the area, just a little bit safer. Dice Lab suggests the same thing up at Cornell. Um, you wanna keep your bees healthy and happy. So you want to make sure that, um, that you do the right thing in the beginning. So before you do anything as far as uh, setting up, get your location ready. If you have a neighbor who tells you they're allergic to bee stings, obviously um, you have to kind of work with that. Um, I've had people move to the area who say they're allergic to bees. Uh, some of them don't even know that I keep bees. Um, but what helps is if they know about it and they have a, they're really nervous or whatever, sometimes a pound or two of honey given to them, a little basket at Christmas time. Uh, that kind of, it goes a long way uh, to make friendlier neighbors. Uh, predators, please get ready for predators before you set up your hives. This fencing here, this picture is courtesy of Tractor Supply and it, this particular setup costs about $100 and that's including the solar charger. This bee looks like he's looking at the sign here seeing if he's tall enough to go on the ride. Um, the beehive in this photo is obviously not correct either. That would be up on a hive stand. I would not place a beehive right in grass like that. Grass is gonna grow around an electric fence and short it for one thing. Um, in front of a beehive, I like some kind of weed block and that way you don't have to mow around it. Bees tend to really, really not like gas operated machinery. Um, I'm trying to explain this picture to you. This is the bottom of a beehive. This is the bottom of a lower box so that would be the brood chamber, essentially. This is a screened bottom board, so it allows for ventilation. So the wood in the front that you see is the landing board where the bees will land to bring in uh, the pollen and their stores. If you notice the scratches on that, that is not a bear. So bears are not the only predators. Skunks love bees. And skunks will come out at night, and they will scratch the front of a hive. The bees will come out to investigate the guard bees, and the skunk eats them. Uh, bears also, they are not coming after your hives for the honey. So Winnie the Pooh is bogus. <laughs> bears really like bees. And you know, if they have like a sweet little center, even better. So protect your hives. Make sure you've got a location where you can set up a nice fence. Um, obviously make sure you shut it off before you go ahead and work the hive. Now, basically I told you we'd be working on the Langstroth hive because these parts are readily available in the area. Um, on the bottom there, you can see that there is a base, a stand. That stand has to be level side to side, but it should tip slightly, slightly forward. Like you wouldn't see it unless you put a level on it. The reason for that is if the hive is slightly forward, any water that might get in there will drain out towards the front. The piece right above that is that bottom board. This is a solid bottom board in this photo, not like the screen one that I just showed you, which wasn't the best picture. Um, so that bottom, that lower deep will be the brood box. Uh, on top of that, once they start filling that in and they're to the last two frames at the outer edge, you go ahead and you add the second deep. And from there, you monitor that on your inspections. And when that starts getting full, it's time to start adding honey supers. Above any of the boxes, whether you have one or three, you've got an inner cover that's really just a frame that holds it up a little bit with a hole in the center. Uh, and then on top of that is the outer cover. That usually has a metal piece on top so it protects the wood from rotting. Um, I suggest that people at the beginning get their Langstroth hive, put it together yourself because if you can do that, make sure you have a square and the box winds up square. You're gonna learn more about the parts of the hive and what they do just by doing. Um, Protective gear we'll get into, um, a few good books on beekeeping. There's nothing like a good book. Um, you can get most of this equipment from local beekeepers, but if there's nobody near you or you don't wanna go face to face now with COVID and all that, 
you can actually order hives on Amazon if you have to. Um, you need a notebook and a pen for inspection and the Sharpie to mark the frames. Uh, this picture is a little bit more detailed than we really need it to be. To start with hives, you do need your protective equipment. Those look like the kid skin gloves right there. I suggest to people that um, kind of shop around a little bit and see what works for you as far as protective equipment. On the top right there is the smoker and we'll go over fuels for that. The, uh, it's not showing up the same color in this one. Um, the, the lower, the uh, fourth from the left is a hive tool and that's invaluable because you're getting in between the frames. Um, kind of works like a screwdriver, like a scraper, a little bit of everything. What's nice to have, some of the things in this photo you'll never use unless you're doing wire crimping frames. Uh, the top left, that's a frame grabber. I'll go into more detail in a second on that. Um, these are additional. As I say, you don't need them. The frame grabber is nice though. When you have gloves on and you're trying to get between the bars of the hive to lift out a frame, it's kind of nice to just make a little bit of room with your hive tool and be able to get that um, the frame holder in there and pick up the frame. On the left, that's a frame holder that will fit right on the box, the hive box. So when you take out a frame, you can move it right onto the holder so that you don't have to put it on the ground. Always have to put frames back in the same order you took them out of the hive. So that's kind of handy to have. Um, there's a complete protective equipment on this person. You need at least a bee veil. People with a lot of hair, get your hair out of the way. If it's a bandana covering it, if you don't want to wear a full veil, that's fine. Bees will get into your hair. They get tangled in your hair. All you hear is buzzing, buzzing, buzzing. You can't get them out yourself. You're going to get stung. So try to prevent that. Um, long gloves, some people don't wear gloves at all. It depends on the bees and the season. Uh, closed shoes with socks. If you have socks on, you can bring them up over the bottom of your bee suit and that will protect you further from um, bees getting into your suit. Suits get hot in the summer, so a ventilated suit is a good idea. As they say, you will get hot and when you feel sweat running down your back, you know it's hot. If you feel sweat running up your back, that's a bee. So let's see, everything that you think you could need on your bee inspection, plus things that you know you probably won't need, bring them along because that's when you'll suddenly decide that you need to maybe put a honey super on or um, do a different treatment for mites. Uh, smoker starting is a little bit of a trick. So always make sure you have plenty of fuel for your smoker. Get it lit, get it going, make sure it's not going to go out that easily because the, nothing's worse than being halfway through a hive inspection. The bees are getting antsy and the smoker goes out. The only thing you can do at that point is close it back up, get the smoker going. Uh, notebook and pencil, take good notes. I recommend to people to start with two hives um, because this way they can kind of compare and contrast what's going on in the hives. And you can also borrow brood from one to the other. Um, so yeah, a notebook. I mean, I go through a million notebooks a year, I don't know. Um, so standard, okay, the hive tool, the smoker, you'll want something like an empty coffee can or something else for debris, because when you open a hive, the hive bars will more likely, most likely be um, covered with propolis, which is that bee glue. Uh, propolis can go from any place to a, a sticky taffy material to a really crispy, almost dried out, um, almost as hard as glass. Um, so you scrape some of that off just to make it easier to work the hive. I'm just gonna say right here, don't be crazy scraping this stuff off because there are protective qualities of propolis that are being studied. Um, the bees put it there for a reason. And it's not just to close up holes. There, um, there's medicinal, there's antibacterial properties of it, antiviral. So more information on that, go ahead to Dice Lab and look that up. It's a fascinating read, or I think it is anyway. Um, Toothpicks. Toothpicks are going to be used to test for um, uh, foul brood. Uh, we're not going to go into detail about the diseases. I'm just going to touch upon them. Confectioner sugar, it's not to feed the bees. It's to do a sugar shake, 
Um, this is how you count mites on bees. There's also an alcohol shake that's possible to do. Um, when the hive is first opened, the bees want to investigate what's going on. They don't like a sharp crack. So if there's a lot of propolis and it cracks a little bit, just take it slow, give it a few more seconds. Get your smoker. You want to puff some in the entrance of the hive. I'm going to lift up the top, a couple of gentle puffs of smoke in there. I see my slide wound up covering what I had written here. Okay. Um, when you first open and you put puffs, you can close it down for a second and pick it up, move it out of the way. You don't want a lot of things you can trip on in your bee yard. So the best thing to do is take the cover. Always put it in the same place on every hive when you take it off. Um, you're working from the side of the hive. So these bars will be, actually the frames will be facing you. Um, this way the bees can go unobstructed in and out of the hive. Uh, too much smoke and the bees think their house is on fire and they tend to try to leave, which is not a good idea either. They, get, they can almost get more aggressive. Uh, good fuel for a smoker, wood shavings, burlap, uh, that pulk wood, um, or punk wood, some people call it, which is that decaying stuff that gives off a lot of smoke. Uh, it doesn't always catch, but um, if you have enough fuel in there, it'll work. Pine needles, we have larch by us. So as soon as that all starts to fall, I collect a bunch of that. I also really, really love um, old baling twine, the, not the plastic stuff, obviously, because it burns for a long time. Of these fuels, you need something that's fast to ignite. Then you need something that's gonna be like a medium burn and then a longer burn. That's where the wood comes in. This way your smoker doesn't go out before you need it, before you need to finish. You're gonna move slowly because if you do fast rapid movements, the bees will react to you. Uh, good weather, if it's very overcast or the bees at home, I wouldn't do it. I'd wait for another time, another hour of the day. If you have your schedule so tight that you're overdue on inspection, don't try to rush in this inspection because if the bees become aggressive, Again, cover it back up. You don't want to damage the bees. You don't want to rile them up. Just safe for to come back another day. When you look in a hive, you want to see a good population of honeybees. You're going to see when you pick up the frame, you tilt it down a little bit, and you're going to look for eggs, which just look like a little grain of rice sticking up. Larva, which as the word implies, it, it just kind of looks like a little grub, and then capped brood. They'll be in all different stages because the bees all hatch out at a different time. You'll see honey and pollen in a regular frame in the brood nest. You'll have the brood. Then you might have a little ring, almost a rainbow of pollen and bee bread, which is pollen, saliva, honey. The bees mix it together to feed the young. Then on the outside of it, you'll see a little crescent of honey. You might see evidence of varroa mites or varroa mites on the bees. If you see varroa mites on the bees, you already have a bigger problem than you really should. If you see queen cells and you see a lot of them, um, there's a reason the bees are building them. Maybe they want to supersede the queen, which is just basically uh, replacing her, or they're getting ready to swarm. Um, signs of fungal and bacterial disease you're gonna check for. Foreign objects include yellow jacks who are notorious robbers. Mice come in in the fall. So you're gonna use a mouse guard at that time of year. Um, wax moths and small hive beetles, you'll be able to see them. Uh, in the springtime, if they overwinter successfully uh, and you see several brood areas in the hive covered with bees, you've got a good number going on. Um, and then uh, the first couple of things that actually bloom around here, uh, willow makes a nice polo, pollen for them. Uh, Colt's foot to a lesser extent. That's the stuff that looks like dandelions on the side of the road, but we educate people as to the differences. Then the dandelions will start coming up in the fields. I really would encourage people not to get so crazy with weed control at that point. If it's in a pasture, the dandelions will do their thing. They'll be yellow. They'll go to seed. There's always going to be some dandelions there. Um, it doesn't mean you can't use it as a hay field and you can still kind of protect uh, the pollen for the for the bees because it's one of their first sources of pollen. It's not a complete pollen. It doesn't have all the amino acids, but it will get the bees off to a really good start. Um, let's see. Yes, a, a leaving enough honey for the bees, that's going to come later too. But if you have that lower deep brood box on top of that 
another deep box should be completely full of honey for the bees going into winter. If you don't have honey to spare after you've had honey supers on, do not tap into the bees supply of honey because that's for them. They need to eat that. As I tell people, yeah, they can put all kinds of candy boards and everything in there. The problem with candy boards is it's sugar. Um, think of a human who might be in the hospital and be on like a, an IV drip with some sugar water. It's not that you can't live on that. It's not a good way to live on that. Um, the bees are collecting the honey and the pollen um, as their food source for the winter. Pollen itself can't be digested. So when they pack it into a cell, it actually winds up uh, fermenting a little bit. It bursts open and then they can use uh, the nutrition that's in the, the pollen. Um, so now I went over to the next slide very quickly there. I have to mention varroa mites because it's the pest that's gonna be the most problematic going forward here. Um, what's happening is it feeds, they feed on the fat bodies of the bees and they carry and spread several viruses will cause, which will cause the hive to die. So when you're doing your monthly inspection or every two weeks in the hot weather, you need to do a mite count and you need to treat appropriately. There are chemical treatments, of course, there's cultural treatments and practices, and there's natural organic treatments. Um, things like oxalic acid already live in the hive. Thymol is made from thyme. It's, um, that's also used in hives. Um, it's, it wouldn't be naturally occurring in that concentration. Cultural treatments include things like the use of drone comb. Uh, dr I shouldn't have gone to this next slide yet, so excuse me for that. Drone comb is a plastic frame. It goes towards the outside of the brood nest. The little, the little hexagons on it are larger. So the bees will draw out um, comb that's meant for the drones to use. So, uh, or for the queen to lay drone cells. The queen will lay the eggs in there. Mites love that longer period of time that it takes for the drones to hatch out. So after that's all drawn out, that frame, and when you go back the next time and it's mostly capped, you're gonna take that whole frame out, bring it back to the house and stick it in the freezer. You're gonna replace it with another one that you brought to the bee yard with you. And what that does is you're freezing the drones. So yes, they are going to die. Um, there's, they're making excess drones in that comb anyway, uh, but the mites die. So before you do your next ins inspection, you're gonna take that, let it defrost a couple hours, Put it back in the hive. The bees like a nice clean hive, so they'll clean it all out and start over again. Fungal and bacterial infections include things like uh, fungal is uh, chalk brood and stone brood, and it affects the emerging bees. Um, we would go into more detail on that in a longer class. Uh, bacterial infections, uh, we have things like American fowl brood and European fowl brood. Um, that's where the toothpick comes in because there'll be this sappy stuff inside the cells that you can check for. Um, wax moths are kind of nasty. When you have wax moths or small hive beetles, they will take over and they will kind of eat into the woodenware. Um, yeah, it's usually a sign that a hive is weak to begin with. So there's a reason you have them. Um, two years in a row, I had wax moths in one of my colonies. And honestly, other than taking the hive apart, there's not an awful lot you can do because you don't want to spread it. The only bright side was I didn't have to go all the way to Oneonta to get food for my daughter's bearded, bearded dragon because we grew our own. Colony collapse disorder, we don't hear about that so much, but it, everybody remembers it, right? Colony collapse. 2008 was the hotbed year for it. Um, we still don't know why it happened, but it's a natural phenomenon more than likely. Sometimes a virus will emerge, the bees will get the virus, they'll abscond from the hive, they'll leave, we don't really know why. Um, they will die someplace else other than the hive. If it is a virus, which is what a lot of people think, what happens is it's just a natural progression. The weaker bees will die. The ones that survived it will be stronger and maybe um, be immune to that virus. So that's kind of important to know. Um, it's not really, I, it, as I said, it's cyclical. If you look back in the history books, you'll see bees will get wiped out and they don't know what happened. Then they start building up again. So you're going to continue your monthly inspections and you're going to be getting more and more comfortable with what you're looking for, what's there. You can always call in help. I would suggest a mentor. So please, if you have a local bee club, go ahead and join that or um, Dice Lab also. 
Uh, if you're going to extract honey, you're going to need honey buckets, strainers, some kind of uncapping fork or knife, and then some method of extracting. Um, I don't use queen excluders in my hives. What that does is you, you put it over the brood box and the top super. That's supposed to be, it's supposed to prevent the queen from going up into where we want honey and laying eggs in there. But I like to keep the queen happy. And an old adage is uh, if the queen's not happy, um, you exclude the queen, you exclude some honey. And you, of course, jars and labels you will need if you're going to package up some of this honey. The most efficient way to extract is to use the drum style extractor. They come in a manual version that you're just turning a crank. Um, it's centrifugal force like that ride at the fair. I call it the vomitron, the thing that you get stuck up on the sides. Um, it works well. It's got a spout on the bottom, uh, a gate that you can close. Um, manual extractor, you can get a used one for $100 or up. Electric extractors would start at around 300, sometimes less, and then go into the thousands, depending on what you need. Crush and strain is exactly what it sounds like. That's what I would use a queen excluder for. I'd have it down and I'd crush the honey cells onto that. Um, it's messy. It takes a long time. It's definitely not ideal. For all extraction, the basic tools, as I said, were the fork or the knife to take off the cappings and the buckets for honey. An uncapping tank is a bonus because you can set a frame on it, uncap it. Those cappings uh, will drip down through a strainer in the bottom and you've got more honey. You don't waste that. Okay, so here is, this is a, a, actually a manual extractor. It's got four frames in it. There are two across on each side there. You've taken the cappings off of both sides because that honey is all capped in there. You're gonna spin it um, basically until the cells are almost empty and you will feel the difference in weight when you take those frames out. Then you're going to flip the frame over so that the honey that was not extracted is towards the outside and repeat the process. Um, some bee clubs will lend you a manual extractor. Uh, electric extractors, I say, more expensive. If you look at the size of these things though, there's an awful lot of cleaning involved. So when you're extracting, expect a few hours of cleaning. You wanna clean everything before you start to use it and you're gonna clean it afterwards. You have to start with a dry extractor or you're gonna be making mead because you're gonna ferment everything. Um, so then going back to your bees after all that, you're going to, you've taken the honey, you make sure they have enough if you were feeding sugar water during the summer to a weaker hive, you need to remove the feeder. You put an entrance reducer in. It's got different aperture openings along the front, depending on what your needs are. A weak hive sometimes that's in danger of being robbed, you'll use um, an entrance reducer as well. But in the winter, it's really just to close down the opening a little bit to reserve some heat. Um, but remember, when you're shutting up a hive, you do need to have ventilation as well as insulation, or else you're going to have moisture issues. Um, if you used a queen excluder, take it off. The top boxes, I don't like that this says honey or syrup. You really want it full of honey going into the winter. Um, the upper entrance, you might want to stick a cork in that or just cover it in. Foam insulation board in the top um, cover is ideal. It's uh, that rigid insulation you can get at Home Depot. Um, it's got a little channel to an open entrance at the top that you can plug up for the winter. The idea is you wanna put some, something in there because during the day in the winter time, the heat of the bees, some moisture will rise to the top. And then in the win um, at nighttime when it gets cold, if it rains down on them, they will freeze. You want to strap down your whole hive for the winter. I like the ratchet straps. And I also put a cinder block on top because strong winter winds will take apart your hives. Um, some people use insulation on the outside. They wrap the hive. I'm not thrilled with that because I think it keeps too much moisture in, but I do like the idea of having a barrier wall, either um, you know, for a wind block. I could be hay bales far enough from the hive to prevent moisture, but um, close enough that uh, it will block most of the wind. The end of this says tip slightly for drainage, but uh, you're supposed to have your hives tipped a little bit anyway. Um, when you start keeping bees, this statement pushed my buttons because some of uh, the apiary program people said, the growing number of hobbyists and sideline beekeepers 
and the risk that those operations pose in spreading parasites and pathogens to the whole apiary industry underscores the need for innovative inspection and outreach approaches for all members of the apiary industry. Basically, they were kind of blaming new beekeepers that weren't maybe managing their hives right for the spread of disease. There may be some truth in that. I mean, there is some truth in that. Wild bees aren't getting treated. So the takeaway from this always, I mean, this, this as I said, it pushed my buttons a little bit, but I can't really help that. Um, manage your hives, manage them well. Gone are the days where you just set up a beehive and you can go back there and grab some honey when you want it. It takes work. It takes a lot of work. When you need more information about what you're treating some of the diseases or pests with, um, again, I would recommend Dice Lab to see what you're getting into. Join that club that I told you about, something local. And here's your resources, Dice Lab, Ohio Beekeepers, uh, Cornell Small Farms, any of these, and the New York Pollinator Program, they're wonderful. Um, I manage the Delaware County Beekeepers Association page for local residents on Facebook. So if you would like um, any more information, you can write to me on there or one of the guys will answer. Um, if you're interested in a longer class, please feel free to go ahead and um, put comments on there. So thank you very much. Um, I think at this point, is there time for questions here now? Let's see. That was a great presentation. Oh, thank you.